Hey, welcome back to another episode of Sound 101. We've got Dee Dee Steve in the house, which means this is Mailbag. Let's do it. All right, Andrew, our first question comes from Ricardo Martorana, who is the winner of a VLOP. Yeah, if you're the person who gets selected for the very first question of a mailbag episode, you actually want a VLOV. And those questions come from the comments people leave down below. All right, Ricardo asks, have you ever had issues using rechargeable batteries for devices which provide phantom power? I get a weaker sound level doing that, so I must use normal batteries in order to not have problems. Am I missing any trick? Okay, so it's a two-part question. Uh, are you missing any trick? No. Now, why are you having these problems? Let's break that down. So let's talk about rechargeable batteries. We'll do this in the realm of AA batteries because this is what the most common rechargeable is for most people. These actually produce 1.2 volts signal, whereas an alkaline and a lithium is 1.5 volts. That may not sound like a massive range difference, but when you start to multiply it, like something like a Zoom F8 that takes eight of them, it's almost like you're missing an entire battery cell after a while, which is why they don't last as long as say a nice lithium cell. The other issue, let's say you're talking about just putting a double A in a shotgun microphone. You'll get a higher self noise. You will get lower sensitivity, lower SPL. You'll notice real quick, the microphone does not perform optimally at all when you actually run it with a double A battery. And especially when you run it with a lower voltage double A battery. That said, it should also be pointed out if you are doing a device that is supplying phantom power and you're running it on these lower voltage batteries and you're not getting as good performance, you need to check what is the draw of your phantom power microphone. Some microphones like ours, the S-Mic 2, takes 1.5 milliamps at 48 volts. Other brands are very power hungry and they could actually pull as much as 4.5 milliamps at 48 volts. And if you actually use a lower phantom setting like 24 or 12, they can pull as much as eight amps. So if you've got something like a Zoom H4 or an H5 that doesn't give you the biggest battery life, especially when you have phantom power turned on, you pair that with a microphone that is super hungry, you're gonna have even less battery life and you're gonna sit there going through a ton of batteries. You really gotta pair the devices accurately. Something I th think a lot of people don't even think about. Um, so yeah, this makes perfect sense. You could always look at something like an external battery source for your recorder. Uh, we show that in our sound bag episode. This is actually my real sound bag. I actually built it all out and actually posted. So yeah, s uh, simple, simple little answer. Now, Steve, I've got one for you. Shoot. Well, recording room tone, could you clap to get an impulse in your microphone? and render the audio through a convolution reverb plugin to place ADR in a room. Okay, it's a great idea, but in practice, I don't think it would work exactly as it's described here in terms of rendering something through a convolution reverb. It sounds like you're almost requesting the reverse of the plugin to feed it an audio signal and have it read out the parameters that would create this reverb sound. A reverb analyzer. Right, yeah. which I don't think is really the functionality of convolution reverb. Nonetheless, they are incredibly powerful plugins and using those parameters, you could pretty accurately recreate that reverb by sliding the room size, uh, high frequency and low frequency of the reverb. If it's a bright room, a little bit more high frequency. And if it's a muddy or dull sounding room, then a little bit more low frequency on the reverb. And then also decay time is something you can play with. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, the decay will tell you how many walls are in the, the room and how they're all bouncing around, right? Decay is more about the size of the room and how long it's taking that signal to bounce off the walls. Okay. And the question, it does say convolution reverb. How is that different than regular reverb? Convolution reverb plugins are a bit more demanding on your computer and a bit more advanced because they are actually creating a 3D space and rendering this audio through there to create a, a realistic reverb. Whereas most of the other ones are algorithmic reverbs and it's kind of just a series of echoes. So much easier for your computer to handle because it's not doing any of that actual simulation. But not very realistic. Right, a little bit funky sounding. Convolution reverb, much more authentic sound. Okay, very cool. So there you go. All right. Next one, Phil Jack asks, how is the frequency response of a microphone designed or tuned? Okay, so this is actually a very simple answer and that is there's parameters and variables out there that exist that um, when designing a microphone that come into play. They can be anything from things like 
how tight the diaphragm is. Like what's the tension of the diaphragm? Is it hand tensioned or is it machine tensioned? How thick is the diaphragm? What's the actual material of the diaphragm? They all respond very differently. How many volts are you sending through that diaphragm? Because each diaphragm has its like optimal voltage it wants to run at. And if you don't tune it to that, you're not getting exactly what is potentially possible for you to capture. Okay, let's say Phil is sort of on the DIY end. Maybe he is either making his own microphones, buying components and assembling them, or modifying something that he's already bought. Absolutely. What is available to him? What can he do to modify this? Okay, I mean, that's how I got started. I was a DIY modder of microphones. And what you can do is you can find out what you have available to you in terms of microphone capsules. I mean, the open market has a ton of different options, ton of different suppliers. What you also could do is find out the nitty gritty details from those suppliers. If you are looking for a certain sound, if you've read in the forums like, oh, this material gives me a better resistance to moisture. This material will give you a warmer sound. This tension on my capsule is exactly the tension I want because I want that sustained kind of warmth in my microphone. Then what you can do is the things after the capsule, like the circuit board design. Are you gonna add a low cut to try to modify the kind of frequency response? Or are you gonna do a high cut, try to modify the frequency response of the capsule you've selected? This way you can kind of play with that, you know, graphical EQ and the frequency response post in the actual circuit board design, as well as the placement of the microphone in the actual like housing uh, will play into kind of how it sounds. And DIYers have those options. So there's a lot at play here. There's a lot of different available like parameters that you can kind of play with to design your sound. And that is a, that's how a microphone is designed. Cool. Okay, Steve, I've got a question for you. What would you recommend for a setup with three people close together around the table in a pretty dry room? Would that be three lavs? two hypercardioids and an XY, or two cardioids and an XY. Okay, so I think there are a couple of variables at work here, but the two best options as I see it are three loves and two cardioids in an XY pattern. I think if you're using two hypercardioids, so a little bit more directional than cardioids in the XY pattern, you may have a little bit of a gap in your pickup in the middle, so your mm -hmm. middle person may not be uh, captured as well. So the lavs are your first choice and the cardioids are your second, but why? Three lavs would be my first one because as we've talked about extensively, you can't beat signal source and microphone proximity. The closer it is, the, the more isolated it's gonna be. Even with Omni microphones, it's just you're gonna have a better signal there. Mm -hmm. Some things you would have to consider are there's always phasing issues, especially if this is described as a tight room, people are going to be close together, there's going to be channel bleed between the two. Mm -hmm. So if you have something like an auto mix setup, or if you're down to do the, the key framing in your post, then it's not a huge issue, but certainly something to consider. Also the appearance of this, are you hiding the lobs? Do you mind if they're just visibly clipped on there? If you have an XY setup, do you want it on the table, almost podcaster style that's in your shot, or are you gonna be booming it above the people outside of the camera's view? Things to consider. Also, I think the biggest thing to consider is this dry room idea. I mean, is there, you're gonna pick up room if you do an XY, you're- Right. What is that gonna sound like? Right. And that is something that I guess the hypercardioids would perform better because they're going to pick up a little bit less of the room than the cardioids because they are more directional. But if it is a dry room as advertised, then it shouldn't be too much of an issue. The other thing that with the two cardioids set up, we'd probably recommend mixing this down into a mono mm -hmm. because otherwise you're going to have sort of a 3D effect. And when the person on the right talks, you hear it a little bit more in the right channel. That could be a cool effect, but probably not ideal for most purposes. Those are the two that I would pick depending on, like I said, budget, appearances, and how much audio post work you wanna be doing. Yep. Okay, Andrew, our final question is for you coming from Jeremy's Video Vault. Got this. What are the basics for using radio mics? Also, what? what's a radio mic? Okay, so what are radio mics? Uh, this is what the Europeans and mostly people from the UK call wireless microphones. Oh. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the basics? I think the thing that often gets overlooked is battery maintenance and all your obligations to the power sources of your wireless. I think a lot of people kind of just, they just think, oh, well, if it dies in the middle of my shoot, no big deal, I'll just change out the batteries. And it's like, cool, but you also could plan ahead. 
I think a lot of people, you know, think about it as a last minute kind of thing mm -hmm. instead of being a first and foremost. If you can avoid stopping down production because you have to change batteries, you know, that's a bonus. And I think a lot of people will also skimp out and buy the cheapest batteries possible for their wireless because they think they're saving time and money, but in the end of the day, they're really actually like wasting their time by changing the batteries all the time. Hmm. On nicer kits, they'll actually transmit the battery life to your receiver, so you can actually schedule out, oh, I know the battery's gonna die in about two hours or so, or oh, we're about to stop down and do a set change, I'll change them now. Like, I think you can be preemptive on that kind of stuff and actually do it with gusto and with respect to the rest of the production instead of just always throwing it to the back of your heads. I think a lot of people don't do that and that's a real basic item with radio mics that you can actually like kind of bring to the production. The other things with radio mics I think a lot of people kind of ignore is interference. They don't think about when they're traveling, oh, if I'm going to another city, are there gonna be interferences in that city that aren't present in mine? And often these interferences are TV stations. Uh, for those in 2.4 gigahertz world, that is, am I about to actually be doing a production in a room with a, you know, half a watt, one watt Wi-Fi transmitter, which often has RF spray across the whole 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So you gotta take all that consideration, like what's actually around me that could be causing the interference, try to identify that, and then try to find a solution by usually just separating your frequency from the interference or physically separating your receivers from the interference. Sometimes it's a proximity effect. So those are the basics and we are actually gonna do an advanced video coming soon. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that wraps up another episode of Mailbag. Five in, five out. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. Hey, no problem. Happy to help. Yeah, as always, don't forget and leave your comments below if you've got questions and you want to be featured on Mailbag or if you just have any kinds of questions in general, sometimes we'll pop down there and actually directly answer them much faster than these episodes. Uh, don't forget that bell for notifications and subscribe to our channel. We post videos every single Monday. I'm Andrew from DD Microphones. Thank you for watching. Thank you.